the fifth section of this presentation actually combines what in a face to face situation would be 5 and 6. We really look here in, in this section at what are, the app, what are the problems and the challenges that emerge when we try to apply ICTs in development. And these are particularly problems whether they relate to policy to, or to implementations. These are things that are very, very necessary to understand up ahead because the failure or success of a particular model can depend upon our understanding of the context and the conditions and the way in which we apply technologies. So while you may wish to look at this as in a face-to-face -face setting of two sessions, essentially I'm trying to link both the problems and the policies, uh, the problems and the issues which the implementation challenges so that you can see a whole pattern that emerges uh, together. And with this, we will start by looking at the fact that when we begin to uh, take a decision to deploy information and communication technologies or ICTs, what is it that is happening and what is it that is preventing or helping us to take something forward? The first part of this is really looking at what is ICT policy, what is ICT in terms of a project cycle, what are IC, why are ICT interventions different, and what makes planning so critical. Of course, ICT policy will be dealt with extensively in module two, so I will just restrict myself to some very broad comments that have emerged from observation and evidence uh, of the working of governments and ministries. So taking that in and taking that into account, and into account the fact that other modules also address some of these issues, my suggestions and what module one presents to you is a broader scenario and a bird's eye view of the kind of things that we have to be aware of. In many a country in the developing world and also in the developed world, ICTD, which is ICTs for development policy, still remains the domain of the IT and telecom departments. So the department or the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology is the one that has the domain of looking after ICT for development policy. This is wonderful, but the problem is basically that the development or user departments, whether it is rural development, women's affairs, education, and health, tend as a result of uh, not having a mandate, tend not to have a good understanding or an orientation to ICT for D. And therefore, they are not able to significantly contribute or influence the way in which ICT for D decisions are made by the IT departments. To put it very simply, unless a rural development ministry knows what it wants and how it wants to apply ICTs, the IT department cannot deploy the technology for the use of the user ministry. And because they are not able to significantly influence decisions, partly because of the lack of understanding of technology and partly because of the lack of uh, domain knowledge of IT, this becomes an issue that has to be addressed. So IT for D, ICT for D is not the sole domain of an Ministry of Communication and Information Technology. It involves actually partnerships and it involves the coming together of many a department. And when I say coming together of many a department, I come back to this issue of convergence. Much earlier in this presentation, I talked about how convergence is actually a process of the technology coming together, telecommunications and internet with all media into a single platform that users can access on something as small as a laptop. This is what I referred to at that time and what I said then still holds valid. However, convergence in today's world means much more than just technology. It also means what we call a mix and merger 
of many disciplines, the convergence of engineering sciences with social and behavioral sciences. For example, if you are going to develop a website, you need not only the engineers to code it for you, but you also and the programmers to code it for you, but you also need someone with good language skills to correct the language, someone with subject skills to write the subject, someone to develop the content. These are skills that are not necessarily there only among engineers. We need linguists and social scientists, someone to tell you how to do an instructional design, someone to tell you what colors to use. These are all behavioral sciences and humanities. So the convergence takes place between many disciplines today. Similarly, when we introduce ICTs, we also are talking not just about putting computers, but about actually social and cultural changes in the way in which organizations are structured from separate functions to separate departments and responsibilities. What do I mean here? I mean here basically that the way in which government departments and the way in which sectors are now separated either by discipline or by functions such as finance or administration. These have to change as a much more flatter and a cultural and organizational behavior begins to change in the, to, to work with the new technologies and to work with the, the demands of the new technologies. And this kind of change also brings a convergence of knowledge and interest between different parties who might otherwise have been excluded <coughs> and exclusively working in their own domains. Convergence also means that it is not merely up to the government, but it also means that we must work with a national alliance that includes government, the private sector, civil society, and all contributing resources. And each one of them becomes a part of the overall system to optimize and use the opportunities provided by technologies <coughs> and to deliver their particular part of the task. For instance, if government devises policy, but in a public-private partnership, services are provided by the private sector because they're more efficient, then NGOs then work at a community level to enable citizens to use the services. So it is a partnership or a convergence of alliances of interests in toward a common cause of reaching a developmental goal. It cannot be done by anyone alone. It requires a convergence of attitude, outlook, interest, and working together. <coughs> the partnership then must include government, which creates favorable policy and regulation, which provides capacity building, which provides funding, and which is a major stakeholder. The private sector to open up infrastructure, to invest in services, to build your information highways, to provide the services in a more cost efficient manner. Civil society working with communities, where communities themselves begin to own and drive the initiatives, thereby lending sustainability and empowerment to the community. Perhaps this sounds as if it challenges the existing order of things, but it is a fact that ICTs do challenge the existing order of things and by challenging come up with new synergies by which we can achieve our goals even better. And this is why it is necessary for you to be able to identify which department in your country is actually dealing with both ICT policy making and which are the user ministries. Are there linkages? How do they interact and support each other? Or do they work separately? If they work separately, are they wasting resources? If they work together, are they complementing each other? And how would we make the change from organizations working independently to working interdependently and in convergence with each other? So assuming then, as we have looked at policy and interventions, assuming then that we move basically from policy and interventions to looking at ICTs in the project cycle. The first decision that one has to make when you're trying to plan 
an ICT intervention is whether this is to be an ICT driven intervention or ICT supported. For instance, if you look at the ThreadNet Hunza, it was essentially that this was an ICT driven intervention, that the ICT and the technology and the software applied was itself designed for direct access and that the very presence of the technology would make a change in the way in which business took place. When we talk about an ICT supported initiative, what we say is that we have a development program, but we feel that the objectives of the program can be better met if we use an ICT platform, an ICT software, or an ICT approach. So an ICT driven <coughs> initiative assumes that timely and relevant information through ICT will by itself produce change and improve growth. On the other hand, an ICT supported intervention clarifies that the development goal is number one or is the target toward which we work out what are the technology needs and then look at how we fit the technology in order to make and meet the needs of the development goal. And this relates very closely to what I talked about earlier in terms of direct and indirect interventions. Both are important and both are necessary, but it is important to understand and to be able to define right at the beginning what is the kind of intervention that we are looking for and where therefore are we going to include ICTs in terms of a project cycle all the way from the first decision of planning to the final decision of monitoring and implementation. There are components of good practice which have come from Australia and from many other countries. I invite you to look at them but very clearly you will see that a good practice guide to the use of ICTs looks at answering the questions of why, who, how, what, how long, how well and what risks. Essentially what we're talking about is do a complete mapping exercise to see how best the technology can be used based upon one's own understanding. And there are questions that we ask, for example, is it scalable, is it replicable, is the target groups clearly specified, is, uh, is the goal clearly specified, is there a scope for public-private partnership, is there no scope, how are we going to sustain it, where is the content coming from, and a variety of actually planning issues. So if you spend more time in planning uh, in an ICT intervention and in making sure that these questions are addressed up front, the likelihood of success of a project is much, much higher. Okay. When you make these choices, it is also important to try to understand that it is not just supply driven or something that we think is the most recent, that we do begin to have to look at whether the technology is easily available, whether the physical conditions appropriate to technology choices exist. For example, what is the point of putting a common service center if there is no electricity in the village? If there is no electricity, do we look for a solar hybrid power station? Do we look for generators? Do we look for UPS and battery ba backups? How are we going to ensure that the conditions that require technology to work are also present before we deploy it? What then is the point of putting an IT, ICT or web enabled, multimedia enabled computer if there's no access to the internet from a particular village? It is therefore, it is necessary to see not only what is the technology available, but also what are the preconditions that are required in order to put a common service center, a telecenter, a um, computer, an e-learning uh, school or even a cyber cafe in a particular location. If, for example, some of those steps are missing, then one has to turn around and look at how do you ensure access? What is, where is this center located? Is it physically and socially acceptable? 
there are community there are communities in the world where access is restricted to certain social groups where women cannot access technology where those to whom we target the technology are not reaching it because it's not accessible so is it safe is it open is it is accessible or is there a custodian who locks the room and goes away if you put a custodian how do you ensure that it's available these are questions that are relate as much to the conditions and context as they do to the technology another question that must be addressed is who owns and controls access when i talk about owning and controlling access if we are going to work with technology we cannot assume that this is some prior, some very costly property that is the exclusive purview and has to be always kept under lock and key what we have to see is that the con community owns it takes responsibility for its use takes responsibility for its safety to ensure that it is not only sustainable but it is used there is no sense in making inappropriate technology choices either in terms of what we use we may talk about using the latest technologies in wireless while wireless is and is just not available in that area so technology choices must be based as much on social conditions as they must be based upon technology and the options available themselves the most recent is not necessarily the best the best is what is the most appropriate and easy to use <coughs> we also have to look at what are the costs in terms of the technology being deployed and in terms of funding and effort for the agency and for the user we are beginning to find that there are newer technologies coming and this will always happen so it is not just the mere question of newness but is a question of trying to decide what are the opportunity costs what are the costs of putting the technology in or of achieving the same goal in a different way you may think now that i am not proposing uh, that we use technology on the other hand i'm saying that these are tools but these are tools that are you well used wisely are beneficial but there is no sense in wasting hard earned money for something when it is cheaper to do the same thing in a different way similarly we have to when we choose our technology how easy is it to use or how difficult is it is it already readily available or is it something that is coming in the future 2 years from now is it interactive and how do you build it in how do you facilitate users to use it how do you bring people to uh, how do you allow instances of people using it and there are many experiences where when technology has been handed over to people with very simple ways they are we find that interactivity is increased and that need not necessarily be complex or easy it can be done in many different ways so the choices that we make are based upon costs are based upon access are based upon what is appropriate and are based upon what is meaningful we also have to wonder in developing countries is it portable is it movable can it be used any time or is it fixed in time and space what kind of uh, what are we using is it a laptop i can move anywhere is it a simple usb drive wireless internet that i can access under a tree is this what is going to provide benefit to the villagers or do i have to install a very costly system in a room that is locked how easy is it to install how easy is it to maintain connect correct modify and update when we put in new technologies and we do not put in maintenance systems what happens is that the village has a technology which fails and therefore is not used because there is nobody in the village able to repair it and for someone to come from the city takes time whose responsibility is it to maintain it to upgrade it so when you put in technology also make sure that we have to look at what are the best ways of maintaining of connecting of correcting of modifying and updating it it is not a question of just putting a computer on an internet access it is of all the subsequent work that has to go into determining the technology choice even if we were to put technology even if we were to put 
computers and the internet and the web and mobile phones into far off locations. If we do not look at audience choices and at content choices, we will still have lost the plot. For instance, we need to understand who the users are, what are their needs, what is their profile, what is their learning, what is their style, and who is it suited for. Content that is often developed in cities is not suited for rural audiences because the contexts are different. So how do we create content and how do we develop it? And who does this in such a way that there are no social, cultural, economic, religious, linguistic, or gender biases? Does the content address these? So if you were to design a website, but there is no repository of information, what is the point of developing a website? What is the point of putting in technology in a village if through that they cannot access government services because the government services are not yet on the web. The government services in terms of documents, files, etc. are actually the content. And this is how in ICT technology we talk about it. There is hardware and there is content. And the content has to be realistic in terms of community experiences. Is it locally developed? We talked earlier about how many technologies become irrelevant because the content is not locally developed or problem specific. So we have to look at content in terms of is it locally developed or is it developed in some far off country, modified, adapted and put here so it doesn't make any sense. So one begins to look at these issues and some of these issues are harder to answer and harder to plan for than just putting a computer with an internet access in a village. We begin to look at how content is organized, how we're meeting information needs. Has um, the technology been uh, uh, you know, modified to make it easier for the users? For example, if you're talking about illiterate communities, perhaps you should put a touch screen monitor where they can touch and get the information because they do not know how to read the keyboard. There are different ways of doing this. So the technologies do exist for making things easier to use in terms of hear, hearing and understanding. If you find that a voice activated system is better, then you might want to go for that because that is going to be something that overcomes a literacy barrier. So your content and technology choices are completely interlinked. And <coughs> when you begin to look at them, you cannot look in a project cycle of how you do different things. One, one has an intrinsic link with the other. And even if you develop a website, if you develop a portal, you develop online learning lessons, but they're not in the local language or with local examples, again, you would lose it. So please, when you begin to develop issues, when you begin to plan ICTUs, look on the one hand at policy, look at implementation choices between direct and indirect in terms of programs. Look at what technology you're going to lose. You look at who the trainers are. Look at how the content is going to be organized. Look at it in essence. Look at it in a holistic way. What support systems? What does the content encourage? Is there interactivity? What support systems are there? Are there ground level facilitators? Are there people in the village who will explain the materials? Is there a young man in the village who will then fill out a form, whether it's for the Right to Information Act or it is for a government loan? Is there somebody who will fill out the form for the villager who cannot read and write? What mechanisms are there in place for correction and modification? And have we put in mechanisms that tell us that when we test and find that we're not doing well, that we're able to correct and update information? So these are not issues that are addressed easily. And these are issues that uh, impact really upon whether we succeed or fail. But these are not all. I mean, I've given you a checklist in the print module. But these are not all. One among the things that we have to look for is clarity in terms of development goals and outcomes. When I say clarity, just the decision to use ICT is often and sometimes dominated perhaps by an external donor coming and saying use the ICT by the fact that an external donor talks about technology but that is one way of getting you know technology 
in place. So if we are not clear about the development goals and outcomes, if we do not map our needs, we cannot also make sure that ICT delivers what it is intended to deliver. Similarly, many, many and many projects that are developed in the public sphere are developed by government and therefore they are supply driven. We wish to do for people but we do not know whether our population or our people want or do not want this information. In other words, we are supply driven. What we have to do is to create demand driven initiatives. When you talk about access to markets, we have to create the demand for access before we put in a system that provides the access. So it has to be a demand driven initiative rather than a supply driven one. I'm doing this for you for your benefit it doesn't make any sense because the, the, the villager, the poor, the woman doesn't see how it is going to benefit them. So while all these are altruistically well intentioned and although we are charged with the responsibility, a sensitivity to local conditions and limitations including those of infrastructure, access, relevance, language, whether the technologies are robust, sustainable, listening to the voices of the people who will use the, the ICT intervention is very, very important. There is another dimension of uh, factors that affect success or failures and I draw your attention to these because very often when we design ICT interventions, we design them either in terms of targets or in terms of time. The use of ICTs is a process oriented method. It is not in terms of time or merely target driven. If you have a project that you plan for two years, rest assured and you spend one year in just procurement of equipment, you barely begin to show results when the project has to shut down. So it is important to understand that duration is not the key to using ICT interventions in social sectors, which is what the Millennium Development Goals are about. It is a process approach, an approach that builds upon demand, that builds upon clarity, that builds upon sensitivity, that is not built upon time and a time orientation and a target orientation. Therefore, all of this means that it is not just about ICT interventions, but is about government governance reform and government reform where organizations, attitudes, and systemic changes are key factors to the use of ICTs. <coughs> As I have said earlier in the modules and I have said that when I, mean, I talked about governance and government, these are new ways of doing things and therefore new ways require new ways of thinking. ICT interventions are different. They are not hardware but a set of management principles and practices. For instance, there was a time in which you wrote letters. There is a time today in which you write emails. The way in which you do it is essentially different and the way in which you communicate is different. So it is not mere presence of computers, but it's a set of the way in which we manage our projects and we practice that has to change and that is what is different. Very often the ICT intervention is part of a larger hierarchical conventional department. ICT interventions are different because they are flexible. They have to be responsive. They have to be updated or, to, or, or lose the, the, the vital features that they have. So very often the way in which we cannot just set up an IT department in a conventional department in a conventional ministry and leave it alone. We have to begin to look at embedding a particular flexibility, a particular way of functioning into every department because ICT interventions, direct or indirect or supportive, are by nature, by the very nature of the technology, different from conventional ways of doing things. And very often we have to make sure that they can be, be, there is no mismatch between the technology and the social objectives. In other words, when we talk about flexibility, when we talk about how we do things, when we, we have to understand that the technology and the social objective must go hand in hand 
and not separate. There is always a danger and a risk of investing in hardware as opposed to investing in human resources. Hardware changes. <coughs> hardware changes. Hardware gets updated. Internet may be replaced by mobile technology, mobile by social networking. So hardware, we tend to invest in it, whereas in actual fact, ICT interventions are different because they need for us to invest in human resources as opposed to investing just in machines. So capacity building, training, localization, all of these are key to the success of ICT interventions and must be seen as different from the conventional way in which we do things. There are also challenges that we face when we look at ICT interventions. The question is, if we have some money, do we develop something which is on a national scale and which meets the, what we think are the needs of the entire country? Or do we look for local solutions? The challenge is simply this, that when you go for an economy of scale, you may optimize costs and you may reduce costs, but you do not address local solutions. You do not address local problems. You do not bring about change necessarily at the local level. On the other hand, if you take a local problem, a local solution, and a local technology, and it works, what works in one part of the country may not work in another. And therefore, when it works in one part of a country, and it doesn't work in another, it's not the technology at fault. It is that the way in which we have designed the intervention says that we have we cannot replicate automatically. What we can replicate are the principles of good practice. But there's nothing that says that if you go for a very high level, a huge investment intervention, that that will succeed, whereas a local one will fail. And a <coughs> local one may succeed, while the national one may fail. So all of these are the balances, and all of these are decisions that each and every one of us has at some point or the other to take. It is necessary that we recognize that we have to take these decisions and we try to devise programs to meet the requirements of ICTs, which are very different from the requirements of a conventional extension program or a health program. <coughs> to sum up, essentially, what we have been looking at are really new systems of planning, of management, and of project implementation. What we're talking about in this section of the module is really that it is not merely technology, but new ways of doing things, out of the box ways, that are really going to yield results. We also have been talking about how it is necessary for all stakeholders to come together, and that there is active participation between different sectors of the society, government, private sector, NGOs, community, individuals, groups, academicians, other kinds of stakeholders, if it's schools, parents, students, teachers, everyone coming together. It is also necessary that we understand not only just the potentials of ICTs, but also their limitations. The limitations are more important to understand. And at the same time, we have to understand that there is a convergence of regulation and legal frameworks, there's a convergence of technology, there's a convergence of discipline, there's a convergence of stakeholders, and there is a convergence of community. And in the final analysis, technology is not about machines, it about, it's about people-centric approaches. It is about scaling up principles of good practice, and it is about changing organizational structures and attitudes, which again are critical to our being able to meet our development goals. So as we come to the end of module one, we have crossed a very large landscape and we have looked in a bird's eye view at many aspects of the use of ICTs. We have tried to link, for instance, the use of ICTs to the Millennium Development Goals, we have then looked at some examples of the Millennium Development Goals be and of ICTs being used to address specific goals. We have also looked in 
the last section of this presentation at what are the factors that help or hinder the success of an ICT project. I leave you with some thoughts. I leave you with a thought that you must explore on your own because what I have presented to you is but an introduction. You must explore on your own. You must look for examples all over. Possibly there is something right in your own neighborhood or community which then could be used for you to build upon. Explore, use this as an opportunity, a window that opens actually your thoughts, that opens uh, your ways of uh, looking. And let us see if it is possible for us to learn from this module and from the subsequent ones to see whether we can apply ICTs for achieving the Millennium Development Goals. Because I can assure you from my experience that without applying ICTs, we are not likely to achieve the goals as quickly as we would like to do so. So in bringing this session to an end, I invite you actually to explore and reflect on what is presented here and also on the modules to follow.